Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray, your very humble reviewer. I'll be reviewing some recent and classical Lit RPG audiobooks for you. Uh, today, I'm going to begin with The Accidental Duelist, which is part of the Accidental Champion trilogy. This is written by Jamie Davis and his son CJ Davis, narrated by newcomer Stacy Gonzalez, and it has a book length of 10 hours and 29 minutes. Carrie Dix ducked under the lunging thrust of her opponent's rapier, raising her offhand dagger upward to push the blunted tip up and away to the right. She used the opportunity to press her rapier attack with a lunge of her own. A grunt from her opponent, as well as the jolt up her extended arm from the contact, told her she'd connected for a hit, as much as the flashing message in her mask's heads-up display did. She pulled back, laughing with delight, retreating, as the rules of the sparring ground required, so the two in the ring could reset for the next point. She waggled her dagger back and forth in front of her masked face, as if to say, not this time. Carrie had been giggling at her opponent's expense since the bout began. There were few who were her equal in here, despite the fact she was barely 16 years old. Okay, so we now return to the land of Phantasma for yet another round of Who Will I Be This Time? Only not so much. This time, it's Carrie Dix who has the spotlight, and she really takes the mantle her father laid down in the first three Accidental Champion series books and runs off with it into the night. And I have to admit, I was initially skeptical of someone stepping into the hero role that Hal had uh, sort of created for himself, but I can see that Davis and Son have really thought this one out. Carrie, an accomplished fencer, has been told that her memories of Phantasma that she's had since she was a small little lass are all false, and that she's basically been delusional her entire life. That is... Until the Empress, Hal's old friend, sends out a call for her hero to return. And Carrie is inadvertently pulled back into that imaginary world. Now, upon her entry, she opts to become a duelist, where she kind of, you know, chooses what class she wants to be. So, surprise, 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 she picks a duelist because she's a fencer. Um, it makes more sense. Uh, but there were plenty of other intriguing classes she could have gotten. Just, for example, a paladin. So, um, there were a lot of choices. This fits really, really well. And I'm glad that it kind of diverges from, like, a main character class that you would have in, say, Dungeons & Dragons or any other, you know, game that you would play. It's not a standard fighter, thief, mage, you know, bard, whatever. It's a duelist. So, she's a fighter, and yet she's not. There's differences between everything. And I, I like that a lot. It's a new class. It's a new classification different skills. It's really fun. And I really enjoyed the way that she played this out as a, as a player in a real world that she thought was imaginary. Okay. Anyway, uh, um, like I said, within about 10 minutes of her arrival, she basically managed to run afoul of some men who work for the Duke. You know, the guy who's kind of like after the Empress's throne, wink, wink. Um, and she's challenged to a duel which is kind of lucky for her if you think about it. Um, because somebody played a little you know, game of grabby ass yo or something like that with her, and she didn't like that so much. So, as you can guess, uh, bad things kind of happen, and she ends up on the lamb. Uh, the book is then devoted to her reluctantly trying to protect the last grandchild of the ailing empress. And I don't mean ailing. I mean, she's like, literally, she's 90 nine plus years old um her health is failing uh she is on her last legs and they really need help keeping the family line intact and the duke has a lot of machinations to stop this from happening now what i really like about this book is how it breaks the format of the old series i mean as much as i loved how and i really did how dix is tops in my book it was a touch repetitive. A touch. It was a touch repetitive towards the last book. It had become a kind of a, a wash, rinse, repeat sort of thing. With him basically restarting every book 
with a different class and starting from zero every time he entered Phantasma. And I, I was okay with it by you know in book two because it was kind of establishing that. But in book three, I was kind of like, okay, this is kind of ridiculous that he's got all these other skills and he's going to do this. And he had to go through like a whole lot of junk and do it really fast. And it was a good book and I enjoyed it. But it just it just did not have the the flair of the first or the second. This one kind of throws that out the window, okay. Each book also had Hal returning home after each of his adventures. You know, when he got done, it was time to pack up and go home. No, not here. Or at least from the way it, it it looks, it seems that Carrie is going to stay in Phantasma for a while. You know, I don't want to give out spoilers, but she's really po'd at her mom and dad that what she thought was crazy time for her is real and she feels much more at home in phantasma than she does in her own home i mean if you look at the way she lives in her real life she goes to a lot of you know renaissance fairs she she's into sword dueling uh, everything she does is to kind of replicate the the brief time that she had in phantasma so you know her staying that that's probably the most refreshing part of the whole thing so far. And I mean, honestly, 90% of the books out there have the main character trying to make their way back home the minute they find themselves stuck in a game that they really love to play. Well, okay, 90% is a bit of an exaggeration, I know. But you get the point, right? I mean, Carrie is actually reluctant to go home. And she shows little to no interest in doing so whatsoever. So I can't really go into a lot of detail, but suffice to say the book does not end like the other books do. Also, it sort of looks like Carrie will be remaining a duelist for a while longer. Additionally, it looks like Hal and even possibly his wife might be returning to Phantasma as well, if the end of the book kind of continues on the way I expect it to. Hmm... Maybe one of them will become the cool paladin. We'll see. We'll see. Um, there were a lot of different things they could have chosen. And I just like I said, I, I like that that she kind of stays where she is. Now, one change that I'm not doing cartwheels over is that Roberto Scarlato didn't return for the series. And it's a real shame because I'm a huge fan of his. And he was sorely missed. Although, from talking to Jamie and CJ at the Dover Comic Con this year where I got like this really awesome signed book, my first and only so far signed book. You guys really rock. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and allowing me the privilege of getting a signed book. Awesome, awesome, guys. I really appreciate it. Now, they told me that Roberto will be narrating their Extreme Medical Service series in which a paramedic helps humans and monsters alike. Now, it's not lit RPG, so I won't be reviewing that here, but it is something I'll be getting, okay? So you might want to look into that, but I'm digressing. As I was saying, Scarlato isn't returning because Stacy Gonzalez has taken over the accidental champion Reigns from his hands and is now leading the team with her vocal charms. Now, she's she's pretty much new to me, but she seems to handle things fairly well. Uh, I'm not going to lie. She does do voices, but her male impersonations are not as strong as they could be. There were a few times I had to wonder who was speaking, and I also wondered if they were male or female or not. But it isn't like this is, you know, like that all the time. You know, sometimes her male voices are really strong, and some aren't. Uh, and I chalk that up as a rookie thing. I think this is really only her sixth book that she's narrated thus far. So I can cut her a little slack. And, and from what I've heard so far, once she gets her solid footing down, she's going to become a really great narrator. She does some really serious justice here to the characters, and that's all that matters. This book is a fun and family-friendly book. And if you don't mind some killing every now and then, it's really it's it's a family-oriented story. Uh, Carrie, as much as uh, Carrie, as much as I resisted her replacing Hal. I think she has some depth that he kind of lacked. She brings new perspective to Phantasma that I really enjoyed. And I have to say that I like the new format of the stories. So this isn't a one and done kind of deal anymore. And I have seen some serious improvements overall. Um, there's a lot of changes to Phantasma that, and, it, and it no longer feels like 
oh, the Emperor is evil and oppressive, and we have to get a stop and kind of tail. There's a lot more intrigue. There's a lot more backstory. There's a lot more going on here than just we've got to go stop this one guy. You know, yeah, there is a bad guy. There might be two. There might be three. It's hard to say. But the fact is, is that it's really diverting away from the original series, which as great as the original series is, this helps it stand alone. I really, really loved this this book. And and if this is indicative of what the other books in this series are going to be like, you can bet your butt I'm going to be standing in line waiting for the next one to come out. So um, I'm going to have to give this book a solid 8.2. It's well worth your time. Give it a listen and go visit Phantasma if you haven't already. It's worth your time. All right, the next book I'm doing is called Martyrs, Legends of the Great Savannah, book one. This is written by Justin Lincoln, narrated by Matthew Broadhead, and it has a book length of 10 hours and 40 minutes. James woke up in a field of tall grass. He gasped and looked around, appreciating the realness of the game. A brief examination of himself, and he realized he was still in the same body, 26 years old, 190 pounds, and standing at five feet eleven. What to do? What to do? James pondered out loud. He thought he would at least have some sort of character selection screen or tutorial or something. Shrugging his shoulders at the lack of information, he set off in a random direction. The big savannah, as he soon decided to call it, seemed to stretch on forever in all directions. All flat ground and grass that came up to his shoulders. He continued to wade through the grass until he heard some commotion in the distance across to his left. He jumped up to try to get a snippet of the action, but all he managed to see was the grass shaking and swaying unnaturally. Either there is a creature over there, or this game has some seriously weird weather patterns, he thought. Deciding to investigate, James walked toward the commotion as quietly as he could. A text box appeared in the front of his vision accompanied by an audible ding as he went. You have learned the sneak ability. So, Martyr, it's, it's one of these books that I would really readily recommend. Well, that's a lot of alliteration for me to say all at once. Really readily recommend to a few types of listeners. Uh, first, those who are new to the genre would be really perfect for it because it's not hard and crunchy on stats until mid or late into the book. It's good for young adults because it's not overly heavy with things. And it's also good for families that like to listen to things together that's light and fun, such as my family. So um, there, there's, a, there's a few people right there that I'm going to say right out of the bat, it's perfect for them. Um, if you're into the crunch and, and, and that, you may want to want to back up a little bit. It's not a bad book and it does have some stats to it, but it's, it's kind of later as you get into the book. It's probably like... I don't know, like 40% or after. Um, now, here's here's the way the book goes. Well, actually, I would say um, it's it's not 40%. It's, it's more like 30% mark, I would say, is where it comes in. Uh, and you can tell that the book really is not meant to be, you know, seriously serious because you've got, like, multiple references to characters like Lion Dude. You know, it, it's it's more of a young adult kind of thing. Now, James, the main character, wakes up and just finds himself in the game. Now, his mission, as far as he knows, is to take six months and figure out what he can about the game. Any issues, any problems. He arrives in the camp of the martyrs, a group of lion folk. And, and I'm going to back it up here. They're lion people. And, and as much as I like the cover of the book... I had no clue from the cover of the book that they were going to be lion people. If you look at that, it looks like like a, a wildebeest or maybe a pig or a, a buffalo. No, not a buffalo, but you know, it, it's just this weird snotty thing. It actually reminds me of uh, Snarf Quest by Larry Elmore. Snarf. It kind of looks like that more than it does a lion. Um, so martyrs. These people, they're they're lion people. But if you look at the cover. The art's great, but it, it kind of is misleading, okay? Um, and after he, he kind of interacts with one of the, the, the children of the lion people, he's kind of inducted into the group. 
He becomes a part of the line folk, and he settles in with them for a bit. Now, the mechanics of the game do work pretty well. Uh, and one aspect that I like was how the game gradually altered as he learned to play it. And, and I mean, I enjoyed the town building aspect a lot. But the one thing that did sort of throw me was there's just, just this weird game within a game kind of thing. It's like Tower Quest, or, or Tower Defense, I should say. Um, you know, where if you ever play Tower Defense, it's a lot like that. It, it was just it was weird how that was put in. And, and honestly, I don't know why it was there, because the whole book could have done without that. I mean, th there's reasons, I suppose. But it just kind of, for me, derailed the story and was not really necessary. It was just kind of like, uh, I like that concept. I'm going to shove this here, leave it here. And I don't know if he was trying to add in stuff that he liked to play. You know, my dad would play a tower defense game and he would say, hey, why don't you put that in there? Maybe that's what happened. I don't know. But it, it was just a little weird how that went. But the town building was really cool. And, and I enjoyed that. So I could have done without the tower building, tower defense thing, but it was nice to see a new fantasy race, uh, you know, something that's not your standard elves or orcs or dwarves and goblins, as the main, you know, the main character James's best friend is, you know, I, I should say he's a martyr, not a goblin. Uh, you know, this is one of those things where I like to see the introduction of new races, new classes. And, and they pull this off here pretty well. The one thing that did bother me was about how the, the martyrs were handled. You know, honestly, as a species, as far as I understood things, they were on their last legs. And yet they continually did nothing to stop the rapid decline of their numbers. You know, they have a, an enemy that's out there that's seeking to destroy them. And they really do nothing to set up any kind of defense or protect themselves. And, and by the end of the book... Um, I'm not sure if they could even survive with the the number of uh, people they have left to, to, to work with. So it was kind of weird how, yeah, weird, um, how that, that was the case. Because they're supposed to be really smart and tough fighters. And they, they think things through. And But I think there's a reason why they're called martyrs, if you think about it. Because they just willingly give up their lives if you... If you read the book and listen to it. You know, it's, it's weird because they're not like, you know, they, they are supposed to be some really bad mamma jammas, but they're more like, you know, wearing pajamas in this thing out in this desert or out in this, this, this place and their fights. It, it's just, it's just weird how the, you know, a, a tough race is, is wiped out so easily. Uh, and another thing was just basically how, you know, James and his pals behaved. Um, I have five and seven year olds who act more mature and consider their actions better than James. OK, and I find it ironic, too, because the beginning of the book, he's basically mistaken for a human child because of his size. And I just wish that he had been acting more as a grown up. And God, I hate that term. You know, I, I think as an adult is much better a term to use. But here, it really fits. He needs to act like a grown-up because he's a child. And he, you're trying to explain to him, be a grown-up, okay? Be a grown-up. And that's just one of those things that just tears away from me in the story. There was so much good about it. And then, you know, just him being childish about how he goes about doing things all the time. It was just weird. Um, now, in spite of this, the book does hold your interest. And it has some really solid moments that keep you hooked. It is well worth your time that you put into it. And like I say, th this is some good family fare. And if you've ever listened to me, you know that I love family books because I can listen to a book while I drive and get the added bonus of the kids keeping their yap shut for a few hours. I didn't really mean that, you know, much. You know, but if it's something that they can listen to, I'm not being bugged while I drive. My wife is entertained. Everything is good, and I enjoy that more than you know. So <clears throat> this is a good book for a family to listen to as they go down the road. Matthew Broadhead has kind of become a hit or miss with me lately. I don't know what it is. He was so great in the Bathroom Night series by Charles Dean and in The Artificer by James Hunter. Good book. Not that anything by Dean isn't great. They're fantastic. But he tanks it so hard in War Scapia by Garrett Boggs. And here, he's just kind of a middle-of-the-road kind of guy. Not bad, not amazing either. 
I'd say he was solid, but he really didn't stand out. I think for him, it's just the material. Either he, he has a really strong connection, or he doesn't pop as much as he should. Here, he's almost languid in his approach to reading this. And I know I've said several times in the past that I wanted to slow down my narration speed because the action was so hot and heavy. And here, I wanted to just speed it up a little bit. You know, maybe like 1.75 or something like that. I didn't do it, but I should have, I think. It, it really might have helped because the, the story just needed a little push narration-wise. Um, e either way, he was just a 5 or a 6 on the narration scale. If I had to pick him out of 1 out of 10, he's right in the middle. You know, maybe a 5, maybe a 6, but that's about it. And this really saddens me because I think he was about the first narrator who I found that was good for my whole family that even my wife enjoyed listening to you know like you say bathrobe night by charles dean man we have listened to that in our car every trip we've gone somewhere you know kids love them i mean stephanie's great and you know darwin fantastic we had so much fun listening to him then and then we hit like we're scapia and i'm like what in the heck am i listening to you know the narration is just so weird i mean he had like two spots where his duck calls were perfect. Otherwise, it was just kind of messy. Here, it's it's just middle ground, okay? And I'm not saying he's horrible at it. I'm just saying it's not the level I know he can achieve. I, I really do like Matthew, Bro Matthew Broadhead. Uh, I do. Um, but I think that there's just something going on with him in this material. Either he gets it or he doesn't. And here he's kind of off. Um, so there were some issues. Like I said, the book is a good, I don't know if I'd call it a slice of life or not, but, I mean, it's it's a good listen. It's, it's a nice uh, setting. It's got some really cool characters. It's a neat race. There's a lot of stuff happening here. But there's also, you know, like I said, the narration was a little slow for me. Uh, and they were just like, it bothered me that the, the, the main character, the protagonist, James, was so childish. So there were a few things. In a tower defense game, within the book that is what really really um has kind of knocked me down on my stars because i could have given this a lot more to it but that just one chunk it just took me so far from where i should have been that it, it bothered me to no end and i just it was just weird how that was just kind of wedged in there so uh, i'm going to give this a 7.5 stars honestly the game within the game just made no sense and the narration choked the book a little as well. It's, it's like I say, it's fun, but it does have some struggles with. So 7.5. And, and I think if, uh, you know, there's a little work by Lincoln later on, book two will be really, really great. I just think he needs to stick to focusing on the characters and keeping things kind of straight and narrow and, and stay away from like tossing in everything if, from, you know, the kitchen. I don't need the sink. I can just, you know, have the silverware. All right. Next up is Eden's Gate, The Reborn by Edward Brody, narrated by Pavi Prochkov. And the series is Eden's Gate. So it's the same name. Uh, and length is 10 hours and 17 minutes. I woke up the next morning still in Eden's Gate. I immediately tried to log off, but again, nothing happened. If I had any doubts before that something had gone horribly wrong on launch day, now I was certain. My next thought, my browser history. Holy shit, I didn't delete my browser history. What if Rachel went through the ahem <clears throat> on my computer? Maybe that's why she didn't wake me. Embarrassment caused the hairs on the back of my neck to stand. I scanned through my settings again for about the hundredth time, hoping to see a help option or something else I was overlooking but there was literally no support option anywhere in the game. Jax was mixing some fragrant liquids on the standing desk behind me as I rubbed my eyes and sat up from the bed. What is that? I asked as he poured a thin green substance into a vial. What? You've never heard of alchemy? Well, I have to say, Brody pens one hell of a book here. I give him a lot of credit. He takes a few tropes here and turns them on their head. And for me, this was a really fun ride. And I felt that this is one of those series that has a lot of potential. Which means, to me, it's either going to, you know, 
soar through the sky or it's going to crash and burn horribly. Now, personally, I believe this is going to be the former rather than the latter. There's just too much beefy goodness here for the series to just kind of drop off after the ending that we have. I can honestly only see it getting better. So here's the book in a nutshell, okay? A new innovative virtual reality MMORPG is released, and everyone who was in the game on launch day dies. This is not spoilers. This is in the first chapter. Um, their minds are uploaded as they pass away into the world of Eden's Gate, unwitting, unwittingly and against their will. Now, the game's creator happily accompanies them on this journey and then promptly shuts the game off from the outside world. Okay, so, so far, you just have a bunch of people stuck in a world they didn't want to be in. Um, you, of course, you know, the first thing everybody's going to want to do, which is, what did I say in, in the first uh, review I did this week, they're going to want to go home. They're going to get out. Okay. So of course that's what happens, but there's no communication between the game world and the real world. And no one who's in the world really believes what they're told. They're told they're dead and they're now permanent residents of this world. Okay. Now Gunner, the protagonist is told what happens by a message alert. But like you or me, he doesn't understand or believe what he's told. So he goes forward looking for a way out and for his girlfriend, whom he believes has entered the game in a distant, distant land due to her being in a different race when they started out playing. But he admits he has no idea if she was in the game when the great massacre of players occurred. Now, where this book really stands out is its characters. Gunner and his pals are fully fleshed out individuals. And I think the best example of how realistic Gunner is comes when he makes a deal with Jax, a man who takes him in and helps him when he first arrives in the game. And then he kind of tries to weasel out of it and actually cut him out of a deal that they'd already, you know, shook hands on, so to speak. Um, it was a real, real life I'm a person and this is what I'm going to do kind of moment. It wasn't heroic. It wasn't not. It was just like, I think this is how I should do this and I'm going to go do it. It's the same thing that you or I would have done in that situation. You know, so I really respect how that played out. The entire event had the ring of truth to it. And, and I could see a player doing that to an NPC if you want to know the truth of it. I mean, they're NPCs, right? They're not real people. Okay. Uh, I was going to say they're and. NRPs, not real people. Um, but the NPCs are real people because they are just as valid in this world as you are as a player. The repercussions from that event were even better, which shows just how excellent the writing is. Um, and the plot is kind of paced perfectly. Normally, I hate interludes with info from the real world, but the real world event had actual significance and it has bearings on the events in the game, in spite of there being no communication between the two. And that's the issue. You see, people in the real world are killing themselves entering the game after everything happens because, well, if you're sick, if you're, you're disabled, if you're elderly, you want to live forever, you want to be healthy, you want to be perfect, you're going into the game. So after the initial huge number of people die... You've got more trickling in day after day after day, and officials think it needs to stop ASAP. So they go crazy trying to shut the game down. So it then becomes a rush of somebody getting inside the game and trying to get to the game's creator who can actually reopen communication to the outside world because no one believes it's possible that they're still in there in any real sense of the word of being alive. So, you know, like I say, the government kind of implements this plan to shut down everything electronic and wipe this game out. Gunner, when he finds out about this plot, this this danger, he's kind of reluctant to agree to do it. Um, he he really doesn't care. Uh, again, this is this is almost like a real person. You know, if you came up to me in a game and said, hey, man, if you don't help me out, we're all going to die. First, I'm not going to really believe you. Secondly, I'm still struggling to understand that I'm stuck in this game. You know, 
you go through this, this is very believable and realistically played. It's pretty smart the way he does this. Uh, the gamer's reluctant to actually try to save the world he's in is because his doubt is so believable, and as is the staunch belief by the politicians that the game is just a game that must be shut down. The rea reactions, the reluctance, the revelations, they're all believable, and I enjoyed that whole aspect that Gunner was not out to win any prizes, nor is he in any way, shape, nor form an uber super character. He's just the player who happens to be at the wrong place at the right time, because he kind of gets drafted into helping this person get to the creator of the game. And he's He is drafted more than he volunteers, I need to stress that, but once he is on board, he's all in. But plus he has ulterior motives, because if he gets where he needs to go, he might just get some help finding his girlfriend. So all in all, this book is really, really fun, and my only concern is the rest of the books will just focus on Gunner looking for his lost love, or it'll sidetrack somewhere along the line. Uh, you know, that's just a secondary thing. But the big quest in this book is, can they save the world? Well, I mean, if there's more books in the series, you kind of have an idea what's going to happen. I'm not a, not a spoiler for that, but I think you figure it out. If you know book one, if they don't do this, the world ends, and there's three or four more books in the series. I think you got an idea what's going to go on here. Um, but either way, knowing that before I went into it, it didn't detract or take away from the story at all. <clears throat> so, Gunner makes some real strides, and and I'm I'm going to wait and see just what happens in the next book because it it has a lot of potential. I can't wait to see what happens. Now, Prozhkov is an excellent narrator. He hits every mark that I could ask for. He does some really excellent voices. He is crisp, clean, and easy to follow. He paces the story well. He adds emotion and emphasis where it's needed, and he makes you care about the characters in a way that I don't think the written word can actually convey. And I keep going back to Jax and his betrayal, and that was handled so very well. I mean, Jax's reaction, the the, the, the vehemence and the, the anger, the hurt, the, the upset, it all comes out. You feel it. You can feel, you know, why he's the way he is. And so every time that he runs into you know, the main character, Gunner, there are some issues. You can tell it just from the tone of his voice. So, you know, Brozhkov really hits this right on the head. And I'm, I'm really impressed with how well he did it. Um, this is a very solid book that was music to my ear holes. Okay, for that, I'm going to say this is a firm 8 out of 10 stars. And I'm really glad to be able to say that about a lot of books lately. Um, having good books to listen to good books to enjoy and not have to like beat them up. This is really happy, making me happy. So excellent work on this book. I'm going to try out the rest of the series as soon as I can. Give it a shot. It's a good first book in a potentially great series. All right. Our final book for the evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you're listening at, is going to be Fostering Faust by Randy Darren. This is narrated by Stephanie Savannah. It has a length of 13 hours and 16 minutes. But honestly, it does not feel like that at all. It feels more like about an eight-hour book, if you want to know the truth of it. Alexander looked around the room and found that everything was gray. The walls, the chairs, the table, the wooden roof, the stone floor. Additionally, everything had a misty quality to it. Nothing felt tangible or real hollow even holding up a hand in front of himself he stared into it lifting his other hand he touched them to each other or tried to at least his fingers slipped through his own flesh and came out the other side surprise you're dead said a female voice alex spun around and tried to pin down where the voice was coming from I'm not sure you'll be able to find me by looking like that. I'm not dead, or even there, said the voice. All right, here's my conundrum. I am at a real loss as to how to delicately describe this series. 
<laughs> the best I can come up with is this is the Marquis de Sade shaking hands with Wolfgang uh, von Goethe. You know, Johann Goethe is the guy who wrote Faust. So if you know him and you know de Sade, you know you're in for a little bit of craziness, okay? Uh, the book both impressed and appalled me, which is no easy task. I mean, I'm I'm a funeral director. You know, there's a there's very few things in this world that I can see that will, will freak me out or I can hear because I've heard and seen pretty much everything you can imagine. Um, and I'm not being negative when I say that at all, that he was appalling. Um, Randy Darren is really pretty fearless in tackling what is basically a story about a man who tries to keep his soul out of hell by creating deals with other people. Now, the caveat is each deal he makes has to meet a monthly quota, and he has to fill this, fill this quota for an evil goddess murder named Leah. Now, here's where Darren wisely kind of shies away of having a monster as the protagonist, because if Alex, who is the protagonist, was bargaining for people's souls, there would be no redemption for him whatsoever. None. I mean, honestly, if he was just making deals to get souls, he's an evil cat, you don't want to be around him, and you're not going to be interested. I mean, honestly, I like bad guys. I, I really like books featuring, you know, the bad guys. So it wouldn't bother me so much. Um, but I know a lot of people, I've, I've talked to a lot of people, and either they loved this book or they hated it. Um, because of the, the the subject matter. And it, it, it blows me away because none of this is real. It's not real. Um, there's no reason to say I didn't like this because, you know, the way that he manipulates or the things that he does here. Everybody in this book is given a choice. No matter what happens, they're given a choice. And Alex is just pretty good at making deals. Okay. Now, Alex is kind of caught between a silly and Charybdis. No matter what he does, he's damned. You know, he's either going to hell or he's, you know, he's going to hell. There's no way out of it. He's got to do this or he's done for. He has to make deals in which he always, always comes off the better for. You know, he's got to have more return than what he's giving somebody else for. And he's pretty smart at doing this, too, for a while. Until he starts getting a little emotionally attached to things. Now, people that he's talking to need to unwillingly part with pieces of themselves in exchange for very little for him. The more he gets, the better off he is. Now, Alex, to his credit, doesn't reveal his newfound power over people. And he really doesn't have magical abilities. See, in other words, you can't come up and say, hey, Alex... Um, I'd like to get a new car, and he'd say, okay, but for that, you've got to do this for me. Um, that's not the way it works. He gives them options, and they have to agree to things. So, you know, he's pretty cool about handling things, and he, and he knows how to mitigate the, the, the creepiness factor that he could have had. Darren, I mean, he, he pushes boundaries, but manages to make Alex likable and sympathetic. And I'm going to be honest. This book is not something someone new to Lit RPG should start with. Uh, if you're a fan of Randy Darren from his other books like The Wild Waste Saga, or even books by another guy that's very similar in writing styles, William Arand, then you'll love this book. I mean, I have no question about that. You will love it. There's a lot of similarities between those other books. And I, for one, have enjoyed every single thing I've read by them. Okay, um... But if you're not, and, you know, like if you had an issue with, like, the slavery issue in, you know, Super Sales on Superheroes, this is going to really bug you, okay? But it shouldn't. It's not real. This is just a character doing something he has to do in order to survive. You got to get past it, guys. Um, the characters are so well written, and they have very distinctive personalities, and they come across just as the broken people that they are. The only person in the entire book who isn't broken or damaged in some way that I could see is Alex's main wife. She's incredibly stable and sane and allows nothing to faze her whatsoever. Even when she's doing heinous, horrible things, or at least allowing him to do that. Uh, I loved her the moment she was introduced. I mean, you know, there's, there's few characters that I can say that with, 
But the minute that he was doing his, I have to get married and pick a wife, she stepped into the room. I said, he's got to marry this chick. Sorry, I'm a little sexist when I say that, but I can't help it. Every character is so well fleshed out that they feel real. And if you know Darren from Wild Waste, then you know you're going to get hit in the feels somewhere along the way. I'm just thinking, you know. Anyway, the only character that felt like a potato was Alex's second wife. And I don't mean he gets married to the first wife and then has another, you know, gets married again. He's allowed more than one wife, okay? The second wife is about as bland as they come, and she is so shattered to start with that it takes nothing for him to break her within minutes of their meeting. And that's okay, because that's what she was meant to be, but really I had no connection with her at all. The action scenes, though, they're fun, and then you get to really see Alex use some common sense in warfare and tactics that other people normally wouldn't in that world. It's, it's pretty cool, and Darren because of this, had a lot of fun storming the castle. I've always wanted to storm the castle, okay? But he had fun. Now, in spite of all the lurid things that happen in this book, and I mean like the breaking of people, and I don't mean the graphic sex scenes, this was a great book. Did I just mention sex scenes? Yep. Yep. If the general content wasn't enough to let you know that this ain't a book for kitties, I don't know what you're going to do, okay? Do not listen to this around a house if you have children. Don't listen to it at work if you like your job. If people can hear it, they're going to get offended because the sex is pretty graphic and it does last. As Darren does not do the fade to black and he never holds back. Uh, there's just some scenes I was like, holy cow, I can't believe you went there. Um, I've listened to some, some powerful stories, you know, like... Um, from Gunmeister Online, there's there's sex in space and there's sex with guns, and it was it was interesting and exciting sex. Uh, this is just way way more naughty, okay. And also, uh, Alex is more powerful than most porn stars, and the volume of the product of his love and the frequency in which he's able to perform. So, like I say. There's a lot going on there that you really don't want other people listening to while you do this. So don't put your speakers on and blare it out of your car um, because you'll get some funny looks. The story is a fun look at what you might do if you were put into a bad situation. Alex really reminds me of Felix, who actually gets a nod here from Super Sales on Superheroes. Felix has to deal with the issue of slavery for the sake of his powers. So... The two both handle really tough subjects in their own way, and now I kind of want to see a William Morand and Randy Darren collaboration in the future. Stephanie Savannah handles the narration, and she's really actually pretty wonderful. She's also a new voice for me. I thought, you know, she just killed the reading of this book. I mean, she played every number, and that would be like Alex's Conquest, with a clear and distinctive personality, so that I never wondered, not once, who was speaking. And she didn't strain or struggle with the voices. It was really natural in the feel and flow. She also played Alex really well, showing that she can crush masculine voices as well. I'm really surprised that she's only narrated four books to her credit so far. She is really, really talented, and I hope that this book will get her noticed. Because I loved listening to every second that she was on, the, you know, on the airwaves. Just really a powerful, powerful narrator. Great job, great choice. Uh, now the book, it was a blast and it was unrelenting. And I can see how some of the content can put people off, like I've said. But I know there is a disclaimer used in the description of the book. And that disclaimer is totally warranted. Either way. I had fun. I enjoyed Alex, numbers one through five, and the whole concept of the story. I cannot stress just how difficult it had to be to create a lead character who has to do really nasty, horrible things in order to keep from burning in hell. So I'm going to give this an 8.4 stars review. I think the next book will be better. And while it was emotional, I don't think it quite had the heart of his Wild Ways series. But that's not to say it doesn't have heart. I mean, Wild Waste really broke me in some spots. But we're only on book one. 
one, book one. And like I say, it 13 hours and felt like eight. I mean, I get through books pretty quick. You know, I can get two seven hour books in one day. This one just cruised, cruised through. So I'm giving them a lot of points here. And I think that, you know, it'll all come through later. Either way, it's a very different kind of book. One that I have no doubt you're going to enjoy. Well, all right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. And if you want to support us, you can like the Lit RPG podcast on Facebook or the YouTube page, or just share and like the video. Um, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. And I, I really do appreciate getting comments below, letting me know what you think we're doing right, what you think we're doing wrong. I'm hoping at this point that the sound is really better. Uh, this show, I've had so many fights with it that it's just very, very disheartening because last show it was it was just it just killed me having to listen to it um like it was i tried everything i possibly could and as you i think you can see i've got a different microphone here so i'm hoping that it does a much better job uh in doing what it, it's supposed to so any suggestions or anything like that i'm gonna have a few specials coming up in the next few weeks here i have i'm really excited about uh and it will also be in addition to the regular show uh so you'll get a regular show and then you'll get a special i'm going to do a dungeon special and i'm also going to do a it's not lit rpg or is it kind of special in which people have sent suggestions in saying this book feels like it should be considered lit RPG, even though it's not. So I've got a few of those I have to get through yet, but that will be coming up. And I have maybe another one or two ideas for specials later on down the road. If you have an idea that you think I should look at or, you know, try out and do a special for, I'm all ears. I'm happy to listen. I really do take time and get back to people on the YouTube page or Facebook. So if you've got something you want to say, let me know. I'm happy to talk to you about anything, any issues you have or any suggestions you have for me to do in the future. Let me know those things. I really do, really do want to make this show as good as I possibly can because I enjoy doing it. It's fun. Uh, and I'm sorry tonight, prop guy was not home. Uh, he and his mother have gone back to visit their, you know, their relatives back home and I'm stuck working. So there's no way around it. I'm here and they're gone and prop guy can't help me. So I'm trying to hold back a couple of videos right now to record because there's some things I really need a prop guy for. So any suggestions, anything you need me to change or do, let me know and I will take care of it for you. Thank you and keep listening.